I'm Justin Trowbridge, um, and uh, Contemporary Analysis. Uh, first and foremost, thanks everyone to the Night Owl for Insomnia after my game for making it to a 9 a.m. session. It's always fun. Um, so without too much, we'll get into it here. Uh, got a little gift for you guys, a little something fun. Okay, everyone sit back and listen closely, because now we're going to find out about data hierarchy, or is it data hierarchy? It's either data or data. I can never get those two straight. But it's, uh, so let's say it's data hierarchy. That means if you're, if you're going out for a romantic evening and uh, the thing you're going out with, it's a hierarchy, then you would, that would be, you date a hierarchy. And that would be data hierarchy. Data hierarchy, a hierarchy would be a data. Data, uh, that's if you don't speak clear English. You'd go, data hierarchy. And, One eternity later. And uh, as a way of drawing attention, you see that? Data hierarchy, and uh, I don't know, it's hierarchy is a difference than lowerarchy, and, uh, and if... Several bad puns later. Here's Justin to explain it, and if you've listened to Justin before, he's not good at explaining things, so you'll probably be more confused. Uh, Justin doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. But that doesn't matter. Uh, just listen and not yet, okay? So, I uh, figured that's my little gift to you guys for showing up early on. Uh, but here's a little bit about me real quick. Uh, born in Ohio. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in industrial design and technology from Nerds in Colorado. Master's in marketing from Bellevue. Um, I had a FINRA Series 7 and 63 license at one point, so technically I was a stockbroker at one point in my career. Um, I'm six foot three and way more than I used to. Um, I speak Spanish, redneck, and technology. I'm a car guy. Um, I'm not a current member of the Hair Club for Men. Um, I am technically a laird of Glencoe and Lock Haber, Scotland. That's why I'm wearing the kilt. And it's, it's kind of fun. Breezy in the summertime. If you don't believe me, here's my actual uh, credentials for being a laird of Scotland. I have 101 square feet. Charity thing. If you want to be a Lord Lady or uh, Lair of Highland, Scotland, go to HighlandTitle.com. So, why does any of that matter to everyone in this room? Why do you care about any of that information? You don't. There's really not much of any value in that data. But it's data that I've given you, it's data you've collected, it's data that you're working with. That data has no bearing on anything. You can't sell me anything with that data. You might be able to start. A policy of some kind for health insurance or life insurance, knowing that I'm six foot three. That's about it. So part of the reason why we're here is because all of you in this room are at some point the tip of the spear for collecting data. If you're not collecting valuable data, it doesn't do anything for anybody else. So uh, real quick on why we're with developers. Uh, we'll get into the data side of here, but this is the only time a data science company will ever ballpark figures. We hate being ballpark estimates, but it happens sometimes. So. Keep in mind, these are just estimates. But So if, if a developer, let's say, is $60,000 a year, a typical entry-level data scientist, $75,000 a year. That's a person that was in IT, was Excel jockey or something like that. They grabbed him like, cool, you're doing data. Get over here. And they just grabbed somebody out of a pool of people, and they made them start working with data. They don't have any training or any knowledge. Entry-level data scientist, mid-level data scientist, $100,000 a year plus. Senior-level data scientists, the unicorns of the industry, quarter million dollars and up. There are companies that are paying three quarters of a million dollars a year to hire a data scientist, to run a data team. So back to why we're dealing with developers. If, if you're in the, the top tier here, you already possess the skills. You already know coding. You already know how to fix a problem. You already know how to look at things from an analytical standpoint. You're already collecting the data. You already have your hands on it. You're just leaving money on the table. So everyone in this room will automatically be able to do more with data because you're in this breakout versus another one. So I commend you all for that. So getting back to the point, just try a little home. So if you do 60 hours of work on a project, right? You know, whatever you're putting together, that's it. Your billable hours stop. 
you can come back in and do 90 hours of data analysis on that. You can do dashboards, you can do reporting, you can do visualization, you can do all kinds of things beyond that. You've now added a significant chunk of change to that. If you go in and do 30, 30 hours of just strategy and vision for data science, machine learning, algorithms, things like that, you've added 120 billable hours to your, your contract with that client, and you're billing it at two to three times the rate. There's a significant amount of money to working with data. I'm not saying stop being a developer by any means, but by doing what you're doing, you're in the best possible position to do a lot more with the data that you're already collecting. So, bad data. I love this. 60% of the time works every time. So, this goes back to the, the worthless information I gave you guys earlier, right? So, understand the process. Understand what the end result's going to be. Um, you'll want to look at things and say, all right, what, what actual data is valuable to this organization, this person, this end solution, whatever it is. Um, understand what's nice to have and what's vital to have. Um, if you're going to email someone a PDF, it's been vital to have email, right? You'd be surprised the number of companies like, we don't have anybody to get a hold of these people. We don't have a phone number for them. Get their phone number. Just ask. Put it on a form. Make it a mandatory field. Do something basic and simple as that. But people seem to forget that a lot. Um, the big one is observe data being input. We will see people that will hand us spreadsheets uh, that is their data set with millions of lines of, of rows and columns and things like that. And then in some of the fields, it's just gibberish. Someone just mashed on the keyboard, and it was because it was a lockstep process with information that nobody cares about. So a lazy salesperson went through and said, I don't care. Blah, 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 blah. And they go, we have perfect data. Look at this amazing data. There's nothing actionable about it at all. But it was to get to the next screen. So watch someone do it. Uh, realize less is more. Um, sometimes, you know, being able to look at things in the back end. I mean, with software, the solutions that are out there, you can get a lot of data out of just someone being in that session, logged in, you know, IP address, MAC address, things like that. Um, but definitely know when to be flexible and when to be inflexible with the data you're collecting. So there's a point for a yes and no answer. There's also a point for a wide open field. Uh, if I tell you what's your favorite color and I give you four different colors, then I'm going to get one of four responses. But if I just go, what's Tell me about your, your weekend, and you write a whole 16-paragraph you know, dissertation on it. Is there anything actionable or anything I can do with that? So this is kind of where we got started with data hierarchy. Uh, people would literally come to us and say, cool, let's do some data science. We, can you color code our, our spreadsheets? And it's like, oh, it's not something you can do. So we started looking at it and saying, okay, data science defined truly is programming, reporting, business intelligence, dashboard statistics, uh, predictive modeling, data visualization, machine learning, artificial intelligence, data warehouse, database management, uh, data lake, Internet of Things, all kinds of stuff, right? <coughs> Everyone in this room probably has heard some of these terms at some point in their life, right? Okay. So that's the conundrum we're going into. Is everyone's heard of the terms. Everyone gets the concept of, oh, I can do something with a computer and make life easier. How do you execute that? So, I'm a car guy, that fact was true. Um, anybody know what this vehicle is? Who? Say it? Yep. So, Mustang, but it's the Hoonicorn. This is Ken Block's all wheel drive, 1,000 horsepower, twin turbocharged Mustang. This thing will do 140 miles an hour sideways with all four tires smoking. It's the most bizarre thing ever. If you're bored, look it up. That is kind of data science. This is overkill for going to get a jug of milk at the grocery store at 2 in the afternoon. That's data science, but that's what people were doing with it. So we would go to companies and say, hey, here's data science. Let's do it. Let's do data science. We're like, cool. And they go do a lap. That was it. Do 140 miles an hour sideways, tire smoking, tire screeching, all that kind of stuff, maybe across the finish line. They go, that was awesome. Thank you so much. This has changed my company's way of business. And that was it. We never did anything beyond that because they didn't understand that there was a lot more you could do with it. You, know, you don't know what you don't know. So we came back to the drawing board and said, okay, we have this amazing, fun thing that can do all kinds of crazy stuff that anybody can't, you know, you can see it, you can guess, but you really don't know it until someone shows you what you can do with it. So let's just show them the, the different track. Anybody know what race course that is? Any race fans? Anybody? This is the Nuremberg Ring in Germany. This is arguably one of the most difficult race courses on the planet. Um, here's some good facts. These are actually good facts for you. Built in the 20s, 16 miles long. There's 73 turns left and right-hand turns, which is arguable because some of the straights are whatever. You change 1,000 feet in elevation. 
73 people have died racing on this course. It's open to the public, 35 bucks a lap. So if we want to go do this after after we just jump on a plane, we can go go you know power through a lap over there. Fastest road legal lap, Lamborghini Aventador SVJ. Six minutes, 44 seconds, and some change. That's what that car looks like. Again, I'm a car guy. I gotta show you the cars. So when you show somebody this, you go, hey, we're gonna do a lap. Jaw hits the ground, mind's blown. I don't know what the hell we're talking about. We're gonna do this, right? That's not the way to do this. The way you do this, you say, you know what? We're going to do this course, not tomorrow, in three years. And we're going to learn how to do all these little corners, these little you know, bends and straightaways and things like that. We're going to teach you how to put the car in the right place. We're going to teach you when to accelerate, when to brake. We're going to teach you to do all the things that you will need to do to successfully navigate this in a quick time. Maybe you'll beat the event or maybe you won't. But you'll know how to do this at the end of it. And we've got three years to get there, so let's just work together and go from there. And the, the, the pressure's off, right? The visualization, the understanding of getting to that far end is there. Um, and that's what a lot of people that are the CEOs, CFOs, uh, CIOs, CMOs, any of the C-suite people, they don't get. If you come to them with a project and go, we want to do some stuff with data, and like, just sounds expensive, and when can we be done? So when you can lay this out in front of them and go, here's what we're doing, we're going to, this is our end gate, this is our starting point, we're going to work our way through all this, and this is the progress and the steps we're going to do it, they can say, all right, that makes sense, I get it. You get better buy-in, which means you get better support. So when you go back and go, look, this is way more complicated than we thought it was, we need more money. They understand that there's an end point they're trying to get to. You're not just doing that quick lap, you're going a lot further along in the process. So we came up with this. This is data hierarchy. Um, it is six basic levels, nothing complicated or anything like that. Um, but each one basically builds on the last. So um, like we talked about initially, you know why we're here talking to developers? Because this is what a lot of people in this room are probably generating. If you've generated any data from anything you've built, you've built reporting. Um, this is bad reporting, by the way. This is an example from a food manufacturer we did. But um, it's what happened. It's you play, played around a golf and you kept score. That's it. It's that simple. There are companies that struggle with that, and they can't figure out why they can't do anything above beyond that. So basic elemental reporting. What happened? How many did you sell yesterday? How many people logged in? How many did this? How many did that? That's the first step. And so if someone comes and says, hey, we want to do artificial intelligence, what, what's, what do your reports look like? Show me your data. I don't have it. That's going to be a very long and painful process for somebody. So the next step, pretty easy, is business intelligence. So not James Bond intelligence, MI6 would be fun. But business intelligence is what just happened. So you take all the scorecards from a golf from a summer, you put them together and you start measuring them. So I'm down four strokes for the year. Um, I'm up six strokes for the year. Gives you a way to visualize the data, visualize all the stuff that you've put together and you've pushed out into that system, right? So this allows C-suite people to see sales stats. It allows warehouse people to see current inventory. It allows people to see all those things in real time in a very easy, very quick and thing. So it's, um, you know, it's a dashboard a lot of times is what it, it takes the shape of. Uh, but those dashboards can layer different things in there and become uh, a lot more engrossed and a lot more involved. Uh, but it's giving someone the ability to look at it and see what just happened and all that kind of stuff. The next side of this is getting to descriptive data. Um, if you've ever had a finger pointing like he did, that's exactly what this is. It's looking at the data so you can see what happened on the, the round of golf. You can see how you did over the summer. But then when you say, well, why did I lose four strokes on my game? Or why didn't we sell as much as we did last year. Descriptive data goes in and says, you did it because you had four more people doing this job last year. Um, you're doing less because you don't have this promotion. You're doing, your traffic on your site is down. Any number of data points, right? Um, but it goes back in and tells you why something happened. So positive or negative correlation doesn't matter. It'll walk you through it and say, this is why this is the outcome you've seen. And if you want to repeat it, great, then you look for how do you fix that and adapt that? If you don't want to repeat it, you know what steps to avoid. So predictive data. Um, not the magic eight ball, but if you think about it, you've got um, a data set. So you've got two years of the data information that you've tracked. You can see pretty quickly, you know, up, down, whatever, uh, whatever variables you're looking at, monitoring, and watching. Um, you can see why the causation behind it. So you then have a data set that you can start running predictive modeling on it. 
So if you want to predict uh, what person is most likely to engage in this particular activity at this particular time with this kind of activity, you can then say, all right, year one, we know what the, the data is. Build an algorithm, build machine learning, build whatever the case may be. Have it spit out hypotheticals, and then you match it to year two. So you can see how you score, right? Uh, in data science, there's something that we like to call as close enough. So if, um, if you're a salesperson, you're trying to you know, increase sales, if I give you a predictive model that's 60% accurate, out of 10 phone calls, you're going to hit more than you miss. But to build it to a 90% effective model or something like that, might be an extra two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in development time. So, or you could make four more phone calls. So there comes a point like, what's what's the right way to do it, right? So if someone we have people come back like, it needs to be one hundred percent effective, perfect, half a million bucks, let's go. Wait a minute, we we can we just have make some more phone calls? Can we do some more emails? Can we maybe do this a little differently? So there comes a point where you do it. Now on the flip side, if you're working with like HIPAA compliance or something like that. Uh, we built a model for Blue Cross Blue Shield, where if they're wrong, it's a $50,000 fine with HIPAA. It has to be 100% accurate. So it goes through and scrubs and scrubs and scrubs and scrubs and scrubs, and it's had one failure in seven years, and it was human error. Um, and they tried to sue us for it, and we came back and said, no, here's the proof. And the data protected us from a lawsuit, so it worked out pretty good. But that's predictive data. It allows you to see the likelihood of the, of the event. The event that someone's going to do something more often than not. Now, this is the fun stuff. This is where things get really weird. Uh, most people, most companies we'll talk to will stop at level two and level three, right? They'll do business intelligence, they might do some descriptive, but they have no idea how to get beyond that, and that's where these, this gets really fun. Prescriptive data, so I've got the scene from Caddyshack here, is do you think he sliced it in the woods because he told him he was gonna slice it in the woods? Did he predict that outcome, or did he prescribe that outcome, or is it just totally random? Yeah. I thought it was gonna be an issue. So, this is basically saying, what should we do to make something happen? So it takes the data, it takes the prediction, it takes all the things that you've done before, and this solution then goes back in and looks at variables. So it's the if, x, then y, right? So if we did 10% less of this, do we get 30% more, or we get 10% less here? It goes through and looks at every variable in the process and spits out, here's five different options if you wanna make more money or if you wanna lose some, some uh, uh, some wasted space, some wasted efficiency, things like that. Prescriptive data will go back in and it's that helpful employee. You know, you log in your computer first thing in the morning and goes, hey boss, here's 16 different things you can do to make more money this year if you want. Um, a lot of things have to go into it, but if, going back to the start of it, right, if your reporting is garbage, this is making assumptions based on garbage data. So if you're not taking in accurate, actionable, viable data, by the time you get to this, it's pointless. You can spend millions of dollars trying to fix a prescriptive model, but if your data is garbage, there's nothing that's going to happen. To make that any better. The last one that's always fun for people to see this is artificial intelligence. Because um, why wouldn't you have a weaponized Roomba? Um, how many people in here think a Roomba is artificial intelligence? Show of hands. Make sure you guys are winning. Anybody? Okay. So you guys played along, so I won't, won't be too bad. But how many people figure out because I asked it first, it's not actually artificial intelligence? Okay. So a Roomba is programmed, right? Hit a wall, back up, turn 15 degrees, start again. Hit a wall, back up, turn, do whatever. If you've ever owned one of these, you come home and it's under the couch, it's stuck in the middle of the room, spinning. Um, it's halfway towards the charging station or something like that. It's just running a program. It's not getting better or anything like that. If this was truly artificial intelligence, probably double the price, but it would spend the, the course of several years learning your house. This is a 100 square foot room, there's a couch 2.3 meters from the wall, there's an entertainment stand here that I can't fit underneath. If I go diagonally across this, I can do the entire room in 14.2 minutes. If I do it in a spiral, I can do it in 17 minutes. If I do it in a cross cut pattern like a baseball diamond, it takes me 42 minutes. You know, It learns the best possible way to do that task and find the optimal thing. It would never hit any furniture. It would make it back to the charger every time. But it takes thousands and thousands and thousands <coughs> of cycles. Again, it's just taking the data and looking at it and then looking at its own variables on that. So people are worried about AI uh, replacing jobs. For reality, you have to be smarter than the AI to understand how to program it. Um, we're doing something to prove that with um, Lime Scooters, which is kind of fun. Um, Google's AI tells you to go this way. Well, we went every other way except for that way, and we found it to be faster on a scooter. So 
um, some fun things. But AI is where a lot of people, especially consultants, will tell a company, you need to build AI. Perfect, why? It's a good buzzword and it's 30% it's premium on building your machine learning. Uh, there are a lot of consultants that retire after building a big AI project and it's really just advanced machine learning. So being someone that can come in and talk to someone and say, look, you don't need AI yet. You need machine learning. You need to do just prediction, just basic prediction. That's the only step you need. That allows people to understand things. AI has its place, but you have to have a good use case for it and you have to have really solid data on the back end. So getting back to you know, each step, right? So. So everyone, it's just lockstep, right? You have to go one, two, three, four, five, six. It's not necessarily the case with that one. Uh, because you're laying it out there, going back to the Nuremberg ring here, you can then go through and pick out the sections. So we're gonna learn this corner first, because it's $10,000 to complete that project, it takes 20 minutes, and we have the manpower today to do it. The next one, we're gonna leave that off until next quarter, because it's just too much time, too much effort. We don't have the people, we need to hire on four more people. This person's in training, whatever. You can piece this all together, build something out three quarters of the way, 80% of the way, and then leave it, and then come back and plug in the next component to it or a predecessor to that. If you know that you're going all the way, let's say going all the way to artificial intelligence, you know that you can take each individual step when and where it's appropriate. For a C-suite person, this is like manna from heaven. Wait, you mean we can get, we can build this $20 million project and I can pay for it whenever I can afford it? I can build it when we have time or when it's a priority or if something changes in the business model, we can scrap it for two, three months and then come back to it. If you know that you're trying to get to an end goal, if you know you're doing the full lap of Nuremberg Ring, you can do it. So you get your choice. Do you want to go run this in a in the unicorn? There he is doing sideways. I think it's Pike's Peak. This is public day, 35 bucks a lap. Somebody did it in DHL land. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the Germans are fun like that, but this just proves the point. Right? When we first, when who saw that track the first time, I thought, there's no way in hell you get around that without killing yourself. Guy does it at DHL again. It's because he knows the course, he knows where the turns are, he knows when to break, he knows when to do that stuff. He understands how to utilize that tool to get there. So that's a quick one with, with that. In terms of working with data, you don't have to be hacker man. I'm a, I'm a meme fan, I'm that guy. Um, so get relevant training if you're gonna start working with data, right? Um, relevant training is something where you need to find uh, an organization, a group, uh, that is providing relevant information that is part of that outcome. Um, oh, it's amazing, the, the Data Science Academy we run through AIM happens to be right up on the screen right now. Um, we started doing this because we asked 100 different companies what they needed, and they said, we don't know what to do with this data. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of gigabytes of code laying all over this town. Nobody knows what the hell to do with it. So 10 years ago, we started building a data science company. From that, we realized that there's no one out there that's skilled in the sense to do this. Again, while we're here, you all possess the mindset and the skill sets to work with software, to look at code, to not be afraid of it, to ask questions. And you're part of you know, WordPress, which is a community, which is part of data science. Um, so use software that's flexible. Don't pigeonhole yourself in a corner. I think everyone in here that's associated with WordPress understands the concept of flexibility. Um, connect with peers, so I jumped ahead a little bit. So we, we maintain a Slack channel. We have all the, the alumni that have gone through that, that um, if they have a question, they just ping it out in Slack. Hey, is this a random forest model? Should this be done in Data IQ? Um, anybody have any experience working with this new solution? Who's done this in Power BI? And people share information and they help each other because honestly there are 30 companies in Omaha that are doing anything big with data science probably 200 actual data scientists in the, in the Midwest here in the community. It's us and Harvard and a couple other little places that are teaching this kind of school set. So, uh, which is kind of weird because we're, we're not Harvard. Um, but know your limitations. So um, know that if, if someone comes to you and says, hey, you know what, I want you to build this solution for me, I want to build this out, I need you to dev this out. Um, can we get to AI? If you've never done it before, and you want, to, you want to earn that contract because it's a big chunk of change, know that you need to set some, some expectations. Know that you need to say, you know what, we can get there. I understand the concept of how we can help you get there. I can't do it myself, but I know somebody who can. Or you know, find another person to come in, subcontract, work with you, and that way you're adding value to that. You're still getting the contract and all that. Have a plan B. Um, understanding 
you know, hey, this may this sounds like you want machine learning more than you need AI, or this sounds like you just need a predictive model. You don't need to go down that full rabbit hole. You can do predictive model. Um, you know, those are the kind of things. The other thing too is, um, as a as a company, we're consultants, so we're mercenaries. We're always up for working with people that, that get this. Um, so we come in and we white label all the time. We have a, a whole slew of developers we work with where we are their data science team. As a matter of fact, everyone in this room, you now have a data science team. If you need it, call me, we'll do it. It's under your brand, we don't care. Uh, we do the work, we pay our friends, we make sure everyone's happy. Um, but that's part of why we do it. And then under promise and over deliver. What always happens with any project that you deal with data is you will get into the data and you will find something else that happens. Uh, we did a program with uh, Taco Bell, marrying their sensors in the drive-thru with their point of sale. They're like, amount of data, what do we do? So we started looking at it, we connected all that stuff, we built a machine learning algorithm, starts connecting the dots and all that stuff, and we realized that there were, there were restaurants um, that it was taking forever anytime someone ordered a chalupa. We all know what a chalupa is, we know it's on the menu, but they just couldn't find it because it was buried in the bottom corner or something like that because it wasn't on feature. So then all of a sudden there's someone going, uh, uh, uh. We said, just move the chalupa up to the middle of the menu. They did that and their wait times went down to the floor. Nothing. Because people could find it. That's what they wanted. In that process, we also found fraud. We could predict fraud. Um, so we, we noticed there are people that come up to the, the ordering menu. They spend three seconds at the window or at the, the booth thing. They pull up to the window and they get $70 worth of food. Unless you say, I need 70 chili cheese burritos, there's no way that's happening, right? Because you've got to go through the whole order and read it off a of phone or whatever. So they're like, oh, yeah, that's fraud. That kid needs to be fired. They had no idea they could do that. But it was all right there in the data. They started like, well, can we do this for, what about this? What about this? What about this? And so one um, you know, proof of concept turned into, I think, 20 or 30 different projects they wanted to do with prediction with their data. And we only did it with 10 restaurants. So we didn't even get into the full scope of it. They changed their plans, so we didn't ultimately go there. But in that process, we, you know, we over-delivered on what we could do. They were excited by it. They, they realized, hey, this is a good value. And we were going to be set for, for quite a while to do that. But you know, it's a franchise world, so things change. So that is kind of the, the meat, potatoes, or everything I got for you guys today, this morning. Um, these are all the different ways you can get a hold of us. Um, We've got the WordCamp uh, contact us form. It's got everything in here. It's Omaha Data Science Academy info, inter interface web school, for those of you who may be familiar with it, maybe even gone through it. Um, you can get the data hierarchy ebook downloaded off that. Um, all these slides with presenter notes are there too, so if you've got questions. Um, I've got a couple emails, so I'm actually the business development officer for Contemporary Analysis, Omaha Data Science Academy, Inventory Batch Tracker, Hemp Tracker and three more businesses that we're launching because they're spin-offs where we've retained IP of those. So um, help me if you're reaching out. Let me know what we're, we're talking about so I can keep my brain straight. But um, questions? It's a lot and a little bit of time. Yep. So if you're wanting to, you know, kind of convince people at your job or whatever that this is something that either your company can sell or that you definitely want to use yourself before you, you know, learn it and then sell it kind mm -hmm. of thing, um, one of the biggest challenges is that you know, the tools for doing a lot of this stuff, there's a pretty big learning curve, mm -hmm. and your developers generally don't have those programming languages or those tools. So what are some good, like you were talking about like Power BI and all these kind of things, how many of those types of tools, those enterprise level tools or whatever are required, and how many of them are Hey, like, what are the open source versions that you can get your feet wet and that kind of stuff? So, um, good question. There are, I mean, hundreds of different platforms out there. Um, the good news is, once you learn one, they're all pretty much the same. It's just a, the interface is a little different in each one. Uh, we do in the academy. We'll teach Tableau, which because Tableau is just a very easy data viz dashboarding solution. Uh, it's got a lot of flexibility. Um, for the really complex stuff, we'll use a solution called Data IQ. Uh, most of those versions have a free version. They have a, an entry level and they have obviously enterprise and all that. So depending on the application, depending on what you're doing, I mean, there's the, the solutions and options and choices are all over the place. Um, that's honestly the tricky part too, right? So if you want to look at Tableau versus Data IQ, or not Data IQ, but um, Power BI, which one is the best fit for what you're doing? 
Um, so when we come in and work with a company, they go, we're using Power BI. Perfect. It's, it's close enough, right? Um, but it, it, again, it just depends on what the application is, what you're trying to do. So I don't know if I answered the question or not. I kind of yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of it is first you got to have the data, mm -hmm. then you got to know what you want to do with it, mm -hmm. then you got to find the right tool to do the things that you want to do yeah. with it. So it's usually like a multi step thing, but you usually get asked, like, can we do AI or can we do data, data science? Yep. It's like, well, yes, but. Usually the way that we start with that, especially when it's an open ended situation like that, is building the dashboards. Uh, because we'll build, we build out a solution or something like that, we do it almost backwards. We say, what are we trying to monitor, right? Are we trying to monitor, you know, this particular output, this field? Uh, are we trying to look at sales? Are we trying to look at inventory? Are we looking at engagement, whatever it is? Then we build the dashboard off of that set of requirements versus building the dashboard and then saying, here's what it can do. Because as we're building it out, all right, we want to track um, number of engagements. Well, it's a zero right now, so we haven't built that out. And then as soon as we connect that up in the, the dashboard, if that is more than zero, then it works. So we can test as we build. Um, and then in that process, you're neck deep in the data. So as you're looking at um, the different aspects of it, looking for you know, what, what can we see in here and all that, you'll start to realize what else is capable. So if you, go, if you follow the data hierarchy side, like, look, we can get to this. We may not know what these end results are, but if we start here, we'll be able to tell you what the outcomes are, and then we can explore these as they come up. And you bite it, you know, like an elephant, you eat an elephant, right? That old analogy of one bite at a time. Here's what we can see right now, here's what we could do, and, you, and that's where it gets fun, because the outcomes are always wide open, and if someone buys into, there's a whole different universe out here beyond what we can see, that's when you're gonna start getting that buy-in from the C-suite. Especially if they know they can pick it up and put it down when they want to. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this best, but I've got a couple of clients who were like they have heard of these phrases, right? And mm -hmm. and so I'm trying to work with them and, and frankly for myself also to look at the philosophy of collecting the right data, sort of like what you started off with. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to kind of speak to some of that mindset because I think especially for them, like it's easy to get lost kind of the weeds. And so right now they don't even have to be reporting. Yeah. Right? I mean, they can't tell you any of it. And so I'm trying to coach them and say, like, let's just figure out what you do. Day yep. before we start worrying about this, and so just from both the client experience, and then also just sort of as you're looking at all of the different bits and pieces, right, the forest or the tree, so yep. how did you own that skill set and then also convey that to the customer? That, strangely mm -hmm. enough, um, the little trick is turning into a five year old. Why? Well, we need to collect this data point. Why? Because it's important. Why? Be because Dave in accounting said it was important. Why? <laughs> he likes to know when someone's birthday is, why? He, he might, you know, and it's, it sounds dumb, but if you can go past two or three whys, um, it's probably a good data point. I mean, it's, it's not a hard pass rule, obviously, but it's a, when you're dealing with people that, because keep in mind, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so there are things everyone in this room can do that I, I will never have any expertise in, so I always want to default people like that. So if you're coming in and being that expert, just ask them why. Um, so why are we collecting that? And then look at what the trends are. So if you're, you know, Facebook profile, right? So picture, name, uh, about us, you know, all that kind of stuff. Look at it and then go, okay, is there stuff in here that we can do anything with? Does knowing that I have an Instagram account for men and kill do anything to help you, right? Um, if it doesn't have any, any bearing or any precedent or anything you're building out, don't worry about it. And if somebody latches off and go, no, we really need to know why, that's when you start drilling down. Why do you need to know that? Because they may have a use case, especially when you're bringing multiple departments together. Um, sales departments will always have different requirements than marketing. Um, and so marketing will always like, well, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna have cake on a stick on Tuesday and all this stuff. And sales is like, give me more alcohol, more caffeine, let's go. You know, it's two different worlds. And when you smash them together, you're gonna get different requirements. And if they don't ever talk, then you have to be that intermediary in between saying, okay, why do you need this? And why do you want that? Or why don't you want that? Um, and it's just really kind of understanding and just having that candid conversation and really digging down. When someone hardlines something, just ask them why. So does that kind of help? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is kind of more around the data integrity. Mm -hmm. So with all these reporting, predict modeling, and everything, you know, trying to get the best data from this point moving forward, uh, 
is there any way or what are your thoughts on using these same models and reports and everything but to self-check yourself mm -hmm. and to essentially clean up your data? Yep. Because it may not be that you have bad data, but it's you've been collecting data for 40, 50, 60 years. How do you know what's changed or mm -hmm. how do you know you're keeping that? So that gets into part of the descriptive data, right? <coughs> um, so as you look at a... a set of data or something like that, if, let's, I'm, I worked at PayPal in the fraud department for a long time, so I, I always think fraud, I love fraud, because people do some amazing things to try and scam somebody out of like five bucks. It's like, come on, just own a company, make a million dollars, don't believe that it's five bucks. Um, if you had a bad CFO that is burying information, uh, that is hiding, hiding bad reports, they're altering the numbers, something like that, with a descriptive data model or uh, algorithm or tool or however you want to phrase it, um, you can go back in and look at data, data integrity. Um, you can see changes over time, um, especially if you have dashboard. So a lot of people think a dashboard is just Excel spreadsheet. I, here's what I did last year, here's what I did this year, and then this column says plus or minus. The problem with that is if I change this dashboard, you would never know anything is different on this one, right? Well, by putting it through a, a Tableau kind of software or something like that, if this changes, the whole system goes, whoa, right? Because it's all connected through and it can see the flow and it's moving in real time. So it's getting um, hourly, you know, that's the other side is what's a, an accurate reporting mechanism, right? Does it need to be once a week, once a month, <coughs> once an hour, once a minute? Um, I mean, you can burn up a server pretty quick if you need a once a second kind of update. But is that, val is that really valuable to the person using it? So data integrity is huge. I mean, you go back in and you look at the variables, things like that. Um, Another project we did for a construction company was um, project management. They get paid if they're on time. They get a bonus if they're under time. They get penalized if they're over. So their project managers were putting in, I think it was foundations, foundation, 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 foundation. And then the day that, that was supposed to be done, he stopped. It was uncanny. This person stopped every single time on the day they were supposed to stop. Then the next morning, they started fixing the whole road where all the trucks go in and out and all that kind of stuff, so that needed some maintenance, to about the same tune as what they were doing in foundations. The guy was burying hours in other parts of the project that no one cared about. Well, because the, the dashboard was there, I could see all that, that stood out as an outlier. Like, what? There's no way somebody finishes exactly to the second on this project. We're talking about building a building like this, right? You're going to be short, you're going to be long, it doesn't matter. How is this guy constantly doing that? So we built a solution that had 1,300 tripwires, uh, today, seven years later, I think it's got 7,500 tripwires. Um, if you go outside those and all that stuff, a little, little alert pops up on a guy's dashboard and he goes, hey Dave, what are, what are you doing on the haul road today, buddy? I honestly don't think the project managers know the software even exists. So I didn't say the company's name, because it's, it's a tattletale. Um, but that keeps that data integrity in place, because things that don't line up, things that are, that are outliers, that are unusual, typos, you know, you, you screw up a decimal point or something like that, all of a sudden you're going to get a spec way out. And what is this? You go, go back in and see it and figure it out. So, but yeah, 40 years of data, chances are 30 years of it are probably worthless because it's, you know, it's Excel spreadsheet or someone transcribing it from a piece of paper into a, a database of some kind. So it all depends. Anybody? Other questions, comments, concerns? Yes, sir. So, uh, Honestly, if you're sitting in this room, you've got it. Um, so we have two tracks. There's a data analyst track, which is um, data visualization, dashboarding, things like that. Things that, quite honestly, if you're bidding a, pro a project or something, hey, I can build X. Great. Oh, and I can also help you get a dashboard, help you make sure that you have data that's actionable and usable. I can also move you a little bit along here. You know, I can, get you, I can get you this whole scope of work with me as a single point of contact, single contract, single legal department inquiry. We just <coughs> bid this out later on. Versus me coming and going, I'll, I'll do that, but I don't know any of that stuff. Companies want quick, simple, easy. So if you're that single point of contact, I mean, being a, an entry level data analyst as an additional tool set to what you're doing now, super easy to do. Do it at night. You know the joke is, uh, you know, come from nine to six and learn what a data scientist did from eight to five. Uh, you can drink beer while you're in class, or, or fun like that, whiskey. You know, whiskey. Mm -hmm.
So, questions? Anyone else? Bueller? Bueller? I gotta do it. Yes. <laughs> this is a weird place to stand when people walk looking at you, by the way. So, anybody else? Questions? Cool. Yeah? If there was one, like, if you know programming, you've built dashboards before just from, like, your MySQL database or your SQL database or whatever, mm -hmm. and you kind of wrote custom software and stuff like that. But you wanted to get more into this and learn kind of the tools of the trade. Mm -hmm. What's the first programming language you should look into, and what's the first piece of software to make your life easier that you should look into? So, depending on how nuts you want to go with it, right? Um, we we teach Tableau because it's it's easy for everyone to pick up and learn. Um, it's typically they they plug in, and they go, wow, right? It's the things you can do with all of a sudden are amazing. Um, we do a lot with um, we. We're still verifying we are the largest reseller of Data IQ in the United States right now. Um, so Data IQ, so it used to be you'd build, you'd put in the data, you'd run a model, and it would take a while to spit out and all that kind of stuff. A program like Data IQ allows you to run 500 models at the same time. So you go, ah, check all. Literally, there's a box, check all, and then it runs 500 different, you know, uh, modeling things on. Okay, and then it kicks back. All right. Random forest, that's the one we need to go with. What is this? This is weird. This is also weird. So you start to see different things kick out, but that's really if you're getting into the, the true data science side of it, so the machine learning, that kind of stuff, um, which is a, a bit of a math background and all that kind of stuff, but you know, like I said, different backgrounds, different exposures. I was an art student, so I had a math paper for final exam. Right? That was kind of pathetic, and now I'm doing this for a living, which is funny, but I'm just the marketing guy, not the actual data science guy. Um, and then... But we do that because they're, they're pretty easy languages to learn. Uh, we do a lot with Python, just because uh, a lot of companies are familiar with Python and all that kind of stuff. Um, our goal with the academy is to get someone to understand, here's, here's the basic skill set you may not have had. So we have companies that will send people through um, that are the new person, or the person wants to get it, you know, promoted or hired um, in a different division or something like that. So they come through, they learn some skill sets. We'll do entire teams. So we've had companies send their entire data division and we've run them through, and then all of a sudden now they're level set. Um, the executives understand it. We'll teach executive classes. Like, here's how you work with data people. You can't, you can't just go in and make this happen. Make, make data. Make it work, right? Because it doesn't work that way. Um, so we, we go in and we set some boundaries. We set some expectations for C-suite people to understand that. Um, and then, um, yeah, we do custom classes. We've got a, a company that's going to put 12 people through the academy, and we're going to do it completely on site. Um, so that they're their own little book of business, and we're we're adapting the classes to fit what they need because of their models. Um, so the, the classes are like, how long does the academy last? And like what's um, so it's two nights a week, um, and it is twenty four weeks at the top of my head. Um, it's not bad. You can always you, you can take it in chunks. So the data analyst track is three different sets of classes, um, and then some people stop and they go back to work and they they play with data, data analysis, and they do that kind of stuff, they get really exposed to that. And they come back in a year, and they do the data science part of it. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, it's kind of learning your own pace. Um, we've had people that, you know, gave birth in the middle of their, their classes, so they just came back the next time we teach the next cohort, they plug right in and they have fun with it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good setup. We like it because we'll, you know, we'll work with a company, we'll stand up a data science component to somebody. And they'll go, Perp, so great, now we're stuck paying you guys for the rest of eternity. Well, no, we pay that guy, he knows what's going on, we'll teach him how to do this. So we take him to the academy, train him how to do stuff, and put him back. When it gets to be too complex, too scary, too whatever, like way out of their scope field, just give us a call and then we can step back in and do strategy and vision, we can help out. Uh, we can bring more people to the table. You know, if you need it done by tomorrow, we've got 30 or 40 people that we can just task at any given moment to just stand up data science. So we actually have a couple of Alexa dots in the office. And we just say, Alexa, do data science. And it just says, meep. Because it's kind of what happened. Like, well, just make it happen. All right, do data science. Meep. You know, that's just goofy, funny like that. Yes, sir. You have to mention Harvard. It's kind of interesting. I have a friend who's just past professor at Harvard. Yep. He does most of his work at R. Yep. Uh, where does that relate to the other? R, R and Python are kind of similar languages. Um, it's the same kind of thing. It's Different flavor, different interface, uh, but it does the same same end result. Um, so he would probably be able to sit in, he or she would be able to sit in on a Python class and go, oh, I get it. You know, just little differences, little things like that. Um, but yeah, being, you know, back to being flexible. 
we're fairly software agnostic, language agnostic, uh, because it's it's a changing environment. One company might have X, Y, Z, and the other one might have A, B, C. So, anybody else? Everybody's still awake. That's awesome. <laughs> Not copy. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't over caffeinate. That makes it a 15 minute presentation. <laughs> um, let's see. So we got 20 minutes. Do you want to dismiss class early? You guys want to hear stupid stories of other things we've done with data or examples? Stories. Stories. stories? Okay. Um, so OPPD came to us several years ago, and when they were shutting down the uh, nuclear power plant, and they said, um, "We have a huge expenditure. We need to start selling stuff." So power surge, um, solar power options, all that kind of stuff. We built a persona model for them. So we took the 400,000 households they had, married it with public data, and we built a persona. So everyone in here in this room, if you lived in Omaha when we did that program, <coughs> you're in that model. If you've ever called OPPD and they said, hey, you'd be a great candidate for uh, power surge. Would you like to talk to somebody? Sure. Our system looked at it and said, you have enough people in your house, you have enough you're in a neighborhood that has power outages, things like that. Um, put all those together. And so when someone calls in for service, it just flags it and pops it up in front of a service person and says, this person is more than likely to say yes to an additional service like power surge or solar or whatever it is. Um, and then it says this 30% of this, this population, I eh, can take it or leave it. Don't ever talk to these 30 people about it, this 30%. Um, so as they go through that, they have a, a service you know, a customer service person answering the phone, and they literally just get a flag that says, talk about solar, talk about you know, averaging your bill or something like that. We did it on, I think, 10 different products they had at the time. Um, the flip side of it, the marketing department then can go the other way on the graph, and they can say, all right, so I'm gonna market to Bob Smith. Bob needs to get something about power surge and solar and this, and then don't talk about these seven other things. Surprisingly, they make a, a spreadsheet or they make a marketing piece that talks about just those three things and then sends it to just those people. So they don't just blast out tons and tons of garbage, email, you know, mail and email and all that kind of stuff. It's all very, very targeted, um, which is very cool. It's increased their sales a lot. Big time. So their salespeople, after being in some rough sales in my, my life, you know, financial, I was a financial advisor with the year that the stock market tanked. So rookie advisor walking like, hey, so being down 777 points in a day, that's not a normal thing, right? Like, no. But all my clients made money because I'm like, yep, that's all on fire. Let's just put the water out. And then the market came back and they were like, I made money with you. Why aren't you an advisor? Because I just couldn't take it. It's so annoying. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so they are, their sales team is shooting fish in a barrel. You know, it's an 80% accuracy rate with them getting a deal every time the phone rings. So it's... It's fun. Um, one of the other good things that we've done that are exciting. We had a, a company here in Omaha, um, it was actually ConAgra. Um, they were looking at, they acquired Pinnacle Foods. So Pinnacle Foods is a co-manufacturing plant. So they make pies for ConAgra, they make pies for um, Sara Lee, they make pies for whatever, right? Um, they said, all right, we need to have data tracking. We need to be able to track batches through this software. Um, and we need to be within two hours. So if I call you in two hours, you need to have a report back to me in two hours. I said, oh yeah, we can do that. I said, well, we need to have a solution. We can't mix our data, it has to be pure data. It can't have um, Hy-Vee's information or Baker's or anyone else's stuff. So I said, oh, we can't do that. I said, all right, well, we'll get you SAP. We're an SAP shop, we'll get it. So they call up SAP and say, hey, SAP, we need to get uh, batch tracking. We need to track on all of our different companies we just bought. Um, what's that gonna cost? SAP being the lovely company they are. Um, said, not a problem. Three quarters of a million dollars per license. You need 70 of them. Sign here, press hard. <laughs> and ConAgra, I'm sorry, what? Like, we can't just use one light? No, 70 licenses, sorry. Just, you know, make a check out to, you know, SAP and send it in. So they said, there's no way in hell we're going to do that. So they came back to their internal team. They said, can you build just a basic uh, minimum viable product, just tracking batches, nothing special. It's a SQL database. Can you do it? Sure, two years, $380,000. Uh, well, we, we start production with these facilities tomorrow. Um, so they're like, well, we can't do that. So we had done some work with them in the past. They called us up and said, can you build a, a database with a query on it, basically, right? That's all it is. It's nothing special. The website is terrible. Um, 
because we're data people, we're not website guys. So um, when I came to work for the company, I was the one who actually redid the website. It still looks terrible, but um, we built it and we said, well, tell you what, what if we own the IP? What if we owned it and you're just the first client? And they're like, what? We'll license it back to you and then we're gonna turn and sell it everywhere else. What? Yeah, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna build this for you. So we built it, um, it's, we built it in Drupal. Uh, the website itself is WordPress, and then um, it's just basically a, a, a data-linked SQL database, uh, all cloud-hosted and all that stuff, but it, it tracks all that information. We started looking at what else we could do with that. Um, so that turned into um, tracking like EpiPen and Narcan for law enforcement agencies that have them in vehicles, like, hey, this is expired. Uh, we looked at tracking gauze and things like that for bleed kits. We looked at tracking, um, uh, what else? Fish. So when you go fishing, anyone hear fish? So it keeps a, a record count of what you catch for the season, mm -hmm. you know, stories behind it, photos, things like that. Then we spun it into a hemp tracking solution for hemp CBD, where then that same setup allows for the DEA to be able to scan a QR code and go, yep, that's hemp, not marijuana, we don't need to worry about it. Um, and then that's turned into three or four more versions of it. So it's that's why it's four companies that I work with now instead of just two, because we just keep finding new new verticals to work with. But nobody has the the back end side of it, and it's just adaptive because we we built it the right way. So, fun stuff. Anything else? Yeah. Real quick, what are you said? Pub, you married stuff with public data. Mm -hmm. What are the two or three coolest public APIs or data sets that somebody can tap into right now? In your opinion, I'm the wrong guy to ask for that one because I don't actually get to touch those. Um, but I'll tell you this, the, the interesting side of being the creative personality in a group of analytics is I will walk down the hallway in our office and we'll walk past Gordon Summers, who's our, our head data scientist. Gordon is like, the, I mean, he's that guy. He's just got like a million tabs open in his brain at all times. I walked by one time and said, hey, Gordon, wouldn't it be cool if you could swipe your credit card and instead of printing out a receipt, it emailed you? He goes, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. And then it was a Thursday. I came in on Monday and he goes, all right. I built the algorithm, it's sitting right here. This already works, we just need to get a hold of First Data or PayPal or somebody to get the rest of this. It's an API port, I'm like, wait, you built that? That was just a, wouldn't that be cool? Because I was looking through like a mountain of receipts or whatever. So I have to stop throwing hypotheticals out around the office because data science like solving problems. Um, so, and he pulled, he's like, this is an API for this, and this, and this, and this, and then we can use this data set, and this, and this is public record, this is private, this would be something that this person owns. I mean, it's, um, if you like solving problems, this is right up your alley. Uh, because you get thrown a different concept, different thing all the time, and you're standing up random prototypes, you're doing R&D, all that kind of stuff. The, the kiss of death for most companies is they'll hire a super senior data scientist, make them stand something up, and go, okay, perfect, you did a great job, Steve babysit that yeah. and walk off. So we have a lot of people that have been told that that are now working with us because we throw different concepts at them all the time. So fun stuff. Cool. I got 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna let you, we're going to dismiss class early. Recess. Nobody. So stand up here and see this. It's weird. It's a weird feeling. But uh, yeah. So other than that, thank you guys for showing up. Appreciate it.